evening, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Public Library. My name is Jade. I'm a programming and learning librarian here with the Vancouver Public Library, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers and our host for this evening. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. I'd also like to point out that the Vancouver Public Library hosts an array of different programs on a number of different topics. One that's coming up that you may be interested in is our Writer in Residence finale. I've got the poster right here. Our 2016 Writer in Residence is Sam Weeb. He is a crime fiction author and he will be having a multimedia showcase on the Level 3 in the Inspiration Lab on Wednesday, December the 7th. He will be showing his published works and he will be giving a sneak peek of his upcoming projects. For more information about our other Vancouver Public Library programs, you can go to vpl.ca slash events, or check out our table at the back here. It has our events guide and our calendar on it as well. Some housekeeping items. The washrooms, unfortunately, on this level are not accessible, so the washrooms that are the closest would be the ones on the sixth floor. Just go straight down the escalators and go to the back. You'll find the water fountain and the washrooms there. Please turn your phones off or put them on mute in case you haven't done so already. And now I would like to introduce tonight's speakers who will be discussing their book, Placemakers. You'll notice at the back table we also have a publisher or the bookseller that's going to be selling the items. If you'd like to purchase them after today's presentation, you're welcome to, and they will be able to sign the books as well. Herb Auerbach teaches a course on real estate development at Simon Fraser University, Vancouver. His lengthy career as an architect and real estate development consultant included work for IMP and Associates in New York City and Concordia Estates in Montreal. He has an abiding interest in history, travel, and the visual arts. Ira Nadell is a professor of English at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. He has published biographies of Leonard Cohen, Tom Stoppard, and David Mallet, and critical studies of James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. With the San Francisco architect Donald McDonald, he has published books on the Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz, and the New Bay Bridge. I am also pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, Gordon Price. Gordon was the director of the city program at Simon Fraser University until September 30th, and is now a fellow with the SFU Center for Dialogue. In 2002, he finished his sixth term as city councillor in Vancouver, BC. Additionally, he served on the board of the Greater Vancouver Regional District, Metro Vancouver, and was appointed to the first board of the Greater Vancouver Transportation Authority, TransLink, in 1989. Finally, he blogs on urban issues with a focus on Vancouver at Price Tags. We are delighted to have him with us tonight, and please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you. Party of Vancouverites. <laughs> Made it through the snow. Hi guys. Here we are in a library. A place of books. And so much more. But books have a particular importance to you, both of you. Her? Explain the importance of books in your life. <laughs> yeah. You're repeated to, to the wandering <laughs> through books. Stuff. How do you hold up the dining room table? No, I just, uh, books are really, and my late wife introduced me to books and reading and history, and uh, so that's what's got me interested in books. And, uh, of course, when you go to university, you have to read books. So it's, but uh, there are just so many of them. I always feel daunted when I go into a, a library and see so many books that I haven't read. <laughs> uh, how can you hear it back there? Do you okay? Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Oh, books. <laughs> well, I guess I should start with how I was fired from my first job, which was in a library. And uh, I was uh, just starting high school, and I was very fortunate in getting this particular job in a public library. And for me, the job only meant one thing, an opportunity to read and being paid for it. Apparently, the library didn't have that as their goal. They thought I was actually going to put books back on the shelf. I never got to put one book back on the shelf. I didn't last too long in that job, but I think it was the beginning 
of my fascination, not so much, and this may surprise some of you, with the content of the book, but how a book is literally put together. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say I'm in the wrong profession. Uh, I write books, I talk about books, I lecture about books, but I'm really most interested in publishing books. And that was my initial kind of direction. Um, and accidents and things happen and you end up going to graduate school. And my attitude towards graduate school was unlike other uh, people in the program. I couldn't wait to fail because I was going to get into publishing. I kept passing one thing has led to another. So books are a pivot around which I think a great deal of what I've attempted to do um, have made it possible, made it possible. Right, so why this book? But more importantly, why should people read this book? Oh, there are many, many answers. Why this book? Uh, one of the reasons was the opportunity to work with uh, her, who is quite uh, a recognized, distinguished raconteur he knows something about housing. He knows a little bit about real estate development, but he thinks he knows everything about world history. So working on the book with her was a great education for me and I hope for him because it was a process of uh, structuring and shaping and highlighting uh, what we believe were the most important steps in the evolution of real estate development. And that's why it's a history of real estate development. Um, and er, they, take the mic from Ira. Oh, no, I, have, I only talk for 50 minutes, then I give a quiz. And you have a paper to hand in a week from tonight. Take the mic, er. <laughs> Well, um, I got interested in this, why this book, you say, why read this book? Um, I teach this course in real estate development at SFU, and I felt it was important for the students who were interested in real estate development to really understand something about context. I'm a big fan of context. And so at the first night of the course, I give the students a 100 mile an hour history of real estate development from biblical times till now and beyond. And that takes about an hour or something. But over 17 years, which is how long it's been since I've been teaching the course, I've amassed a lot of information from reading, from given to me by my students, by others. And they all said, well, this would make a great book. So five years ago, I started to write this book. And it was written to really get people interested in history and looking at history through the eye of real estate development. And so why should you read the book? I think it's an interesting book about history. And I hope get people excited about history more than real estate development, frankly. Do either of you know of any book that approaches history through that lens? Well, I know I got inspired for the book by reading Cod, which is the history of the world through the lens of the codfish. I said, anybody who can write a history of the world through the lens of the codfish should be able to write a history of the world through the lens of real estate development. And so that's the closest that's come. I don't know of any other book. I did do some research, and no, there is not uh, a book which traces what we would think of as the long history of real estate development. Yes, there are books that will deal with the tax implications of apartment buildings, uh, you know, under construction in British Columbia. Um, but there's nothing which gives a cultural kind of account of uh, real estate development. I think that's true. In fact, you say in the book, the development process remains essentially the same as it has been since the development of the city, Europe, 6,000 years ago. Well, that's true. I mean, you need three essential pieces apart from the inspiration of somebody with a vision to build something. You need land and money and the right to do it. And that really hasn't changed. And uh, real estate developers are always people with a vision of what could be done, not what exists, what could be. And uh, it's been that way through history. There's always been one person, a very powerful person, a very good planner, and a very good source of money uh, that's produced by real estate development. That hasn't changed from the days of war. Yeah. When they built the first ziggurat. You know, if you dig a little deeper, though, that is kind of surprising. Because what you're seeing is that regardless of culture and place and time, this particular process, what we call development, hasn't changed much. No, it hasn't changed. It varies very little 
uh, from country to country or culture to culture. And even though it may be the uh, royalty as the developer, or government as the developer, or the private industry as the developer, the process really remains the same. Is it true also that people have always had contempt? <laughs> well, <laughs> developers get bad raps, you know. I say uh, one of the things I say to the students in the first class, you're here to learn what motivates real estate developers apart from greed and ego. And they say, is there something else? And I say, yes, it happens to be altruism. All real estate developers believe they're doing good, even when they don't. They believe they're doing good. Oh, what was that little <laughs> Well, I don't want the book to romanticize real estate development because we should be writing a second volume, which is the underside of real estate development. I think what you're getting in this book is kind of the top-down view. The key figures, historically fascinating, um, important consequences in terms of their decisions and their goals, but there is another side, and it really is represented by the cost, in you know every sense of the word, the cost of real estate development to populations, to cities, to um, perhaps extended urban concepts and planning. That you know, real estate development has a tremendous impact on that, and we are aware of it, and I think we allude to it from moment to moment in the book, but there is another, I wouldn't say shady side, but there's a side of real estate development that is in the shade, as opposed to in the sun, if you think about this metaphorically. Well, I, I think that's true with literature as well, so writers are in the I would disagree. <laughs> I would say all writers are in the shade sometimes. You guys had a fun time doing this, didn't you? What did you actually, how did this work? How did you work together? <laughs> well, there was some fabulous croissant. Herb knows some great croissant locales in the city. Uh, the way it worked was uh, kind of give and take. Herb and I would meet. He would, we would talk about how to structure the book, what should be in the book, where does it begin, how does it end. Um, and he has great resources, tremendous amount of materials from his teaching uh, and from his general knowledge, of course, and reading. And then I would go off and come back after maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a little less, and say, this is what I've done with this. What's your, you know, response? To it? Where can we develop this? Or is there too much of this or that? So it's a lot of give and take. But I think I've worked uh, with the architect in San Francisco on three books, so I'm familiar with it. And for me, it's a real education. That's why I do this. Uh, the root of the word education, educare, means to raise up. Every time you walk up a stairway, I tell my students, you are educating yourself. You're literally raising yourself up. So I write these books because I want to educate myself and learn about another area. What surprised you most? What did you learn that you tell us now because you found it extraordinary? Uh, it's a very good question. I think what uh, surprised me the most was the ability of the successful real estate developers to translate an idea into an object. That is to take a vision of even something like uh, the early shopping malls, shopping centers, and to convert that into something that is publicly accessible, that is practical and functional, that it actually works. So I think that aspect of it was very enlightening for me um, because often you know, we have ideas, this is how something should happen, but there's quite a gap between the initial imagining of that and its execution. But the successful real estate developer, and I know Herb will talk a lot about this, has the stamina uh, to see it through. But it's not just stamina, you have to have the financial wherewithal and accessibility to make sure that the project completes. They don't all complete. I mean, we know of lots of false starts. We'll get to that. Uh, 
clear about it. As I said before, I'm, I was surprised that I really learned new things. Now, I'm not an expert in it, but I think I'm generally well informed. And I was continually surprised in the book that I said, I just didn't know about this. Well, there are lots of things. I mean, the, the pile of information that I have, I, the book represents those things that are interesting to me. Yeah. And so there's certainly not everything I mean, you can write forever about real estate <coughs> world, but there's just so much. So give us a couple of examples of which well, is always surprising. Two things. Uh, one thing that surprised me very much was the uh, the fact that Cardinal Richard, who was a very powerful religious figure and political figure uh, of Louis XIII, was really a real estate developer <laughs> and uh, did a lot of things, uh, contributed a lot to real estate development, including things like developing the legal concept of a party wall and uh, uh, developing design, uh, design guidelines and things like that, and in fact built an entire city which still exists, it's called Richelieu, in France, so that was very surprising. But I think the most surprising thing is the links that exist in real estate development. I'll take a minute to kind of my standard little pattern, why do you read this book? What is uh, Henry the uh, Henry the Eighth and John Jacob Astor and uh, John Jacob Astor and Al Smith have in common? Now, if any of you don't know who all these people are, Read the book. Read the book. But Henry, I'll, I'll give you a <coughs> Henry VIII, of course, was the king of England. Yeah, how know? And uh, Al Smith was the failed presidential candidate who wanted to be the first Catholic president of the United States. And John Jacob Astor, of course, was a famous fur merchant who invested his money in real estate in New York City. Well, what happened was when after uh, Henry VIII executed Anne Boleyn because she wouldn't deliver her son. And her father died. He inherited their castle, the Boleyn Castle, which is called Hever Castle. So if you just put that little fact aside for a minute. And then John Jacob Astor, you know, was very clever. He knew that Manhattan could only grow north because it was an island. And so he kept buying land north of the growth. And he bought a very big, important piece of land in the middle of Manhattan. And uh, uh, he built on it two, two hotels. One was called the Waldorf, and the other was called the Astoria. Two separate hotels. At, uh, and then Al Smith, who failed his attempt to run for president, had a partner who was the head of the National Democratic Committee, and formerly the, uh, the chief financial officer of General Motors. He convinced DuPont to invest money in General Motors in 1920, and DuPont made him the CFO. His name was Jacob Roscoe. So Jacob Roscoe and Al Smith were really hurt by this loss of the election. And they wanted to do something that would redeem themselves in the eyes of the community and have a project. And so they decided to build a building. Real estate was very hot in New York in the 1920s. So they bought this land, which was the Waldorf and Astoria Hotel, because the Waldorf and Astoria wanted to build a new hotel called the Waldorf Astoria on Park Avenue. And why were they going to Park Avenue? Because electric trains just came. And that made it possible to cover over Park Avenue because you didn't need steam engines to bring the trains into Grand Central. And they had this idea of having a grand hotel on Park Avenue with the Waldorf Astoria and having it linked to Grand Central Station with a secret passageway that could be used by presidents and important potentates, which they did. But the land of the old Waldorf Astoria was at 34th and 5th Avenue, and they sold it to Jacob Roscoe and Al Smith to build for their first real estate project, these two built, the Empire State Building. And they told their architect, make it as high as you can, as long as it doesn't fall over. So, I mean, it's those links. So you say, well, what? where's the original link? Well, John Jacob Astor's grandson, when he sold the land to Smith on 34th and 5th Avenue, took the money, went to England, and bought Hever Castle and restored it. So I found those links in history very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's great stuff. What is this thing about height? Build it as high as you can, so long as it doesn't fall over. Not the first to ask for that. No, be the man last. has always been trying to build higher. Man is the only animal that tries to build higher except for termites. 
termites try to build higher. And if you see some termite uh, mounds, they go, some of them go up to 40 feet. So termites can actually build many more times higher than that of their own size mm -hmm. than man could build. Mm -hmm. So the highest building in, in Dubai right now is only five times the height of a man, or 500 times the height. 500. 500 times. And yet termite towers are 1,000 times mm -hmm. the height of a termite. Just gives you an idea about height. Some people say it's foul. Uh, we've been reaching for the sky forever. I mean, man has been reaching for the sky forever. And there's now, there are now plans to build a mile high tower, twice as high as the highest building in Dubai, and to implement, in fact, Frank Lloyd Wright's plan for a mile high building, which is 5,000 square feet. We, we do talk about this in the book, and we have some wonderful illustrations. Uh, particularly the Frank Lloyd Wright and, of course, the tallest building in the world and so forth. Um, it's easy to say that building high is phallic. It's easy to say it's all about ego. I think it's much harder to understand that I think it's really about power, and it's about individuals expressing their power over <coughs> something abstract. And what is the abstract element? It's space that they are in their own particular individualistic way with their stamp on the building. They may not be the architect, but they work with the architect to develop the building to show not that I can do it, but that I have this kind of authority, this kind of power to construct and reshape, reimagine this particular space, even if it's one block or one watt in a block. Well, that seems to bring us to the other one of the other major themes, one of the, of the parts of the book that I think you do best, and that is uh, likewise with the search for height, a search for utopia. Yeah. That's his talk. My talk. Actually, the book uh, was inspired, or I was urged to write the book, by a uh, regrettably deceased friend of mine who was a professor at SFU, Michael Fellman. Uh, he urged me to write this book and gave me his first book, which was on utopias. And I got very interested in utopias, and I got interested particularly in utopias that were built for profit. Because every real estate developer needs a kind of a hook, whether I'm the tallest building, or I am a hotel, or I have a casino, or it needs a hook. And utopias became a hook for some real estate development. So a lot of the utopias and religious communities that were built were really built by real estate developers Prime, whose prime objective was selling real estate. So uh, utopias have been a fascination for me. And uh, there are a number mentioned in the book, and one most important one is, of course, uh, Salt Lake City, which was, which was marketed as a utopian religious community for the Mormons. And uh, of course, before they ever got to Salt Lake City, uh, Prophet uh, Joseph Smith was selling real estate in Navarro, Illinois, where he would he would go and buy up a lot of land with loans from the bank, and then he would build a mansion for himself and a hotel and a temple. And then he would sell the land around this to all of the, uh, all the uh, people who were coming to be Mormons, and they had to buy land in his real estate development, which was called Eden, uh, ironically. But, uh, he believed he never paid back the banks for the money he loaned. He believed that God would intervene and resolve the loan and uh, he wouldn't have to repay the money to the bank. And there are a number of stories like that, but the utopias, uh, of course, started with the company towns in Scotland, and they were the first utopian communities. So they, they have a fascinating story. We've got a local example. The Powell River. Yeah. People don't know that. Powell River was a utopian community built by people who wanted to get into lumber. There were a number of convergent forces at the time in the late 1800s that made Powell River viable. And the utopian cities, that uh, the utopian villages that survived were those that had an economic base that could support them. So a place like Powell River was able to survive because it had the economic base of the pulp and paper mill. Uh, whereas Swantula, which was founded by the Finns on Malcolm Island near Alert Bay, failed because it didn't have an economic base. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, on the whole, it would appear utopias don't have a great track record. No, they won't. 
all been by a special. For one reason or another. I mean, either they, they all needed a charismatic leader, and that charismatic leader died or was ousted. They all needed an economic base, which most of them didn't have, except a few, like the Shakers, or you were interested in Oneida, which had an economic base, was manufacturing things. Uh, they, uh, the next generation didn't always buy in to the utopian philosophy of their parents. It's another reason for it to fail. And lastly, all of them failed to take into consideration human nature. That people are just not, not the same and you just can't put them into a mold and expect them to behave the way we have to in order to keep a utopian community utopian. So those are the reasons for it. Uh, invariably, when it comes to this discussion, we focus on buildings. But the book's called Placemakers. What? What is the role or the outcome of development on place? as we think of it in terms of urban design. Yeah, sure. <laughs> get both hands. Well, the, uh, the granddaddy of real estate developers for me in, the, in our modern time in North America was William Zeckendorf. And he had a what he called the five-fourths principle, or I teach it to my students. And imagine if there are three blocks of land, and you buy each block for $5 each. And you invest $10 in the middle block and turn it into a park or a great place. The abutting land is now worth $25 each. And this is how you make places and how you make successful real estate. If you have a successful place, Plaza Marie Marie is an example. They moved the center of, of, uh, of Montreal from St. James Street to Dorchester Boulevard by creating a great place and a place that then would enhance the value of the real estate around it. So creating great places is not easy and, and to make sure that they're animated and viable. I always tell people in cities, if you don't know where you put your Christmas tree, you don't have a great place in your town. I think that, again, architecture mixes with urban design in terms of a long view of this topic. And you think of European cities built around the piazza, built around the square, built adjacent to where the church might be located. And if the church is there, frequently a bank is there. Um, and another type of public building, perhaps a forum or a coliseum. So you need these places, and just as her was explaining, that uh, act as a magnet, that people want to live near the Vancouver Public Library or the Art Gallery. Uh, these are, they're both civic and cultural um, um, kind of transmission towers that send out uh, a kind of cultural, social, sometimes political and sometimes economic set of uh, radio waves that attract people, that people listen and they want to be close to those particular centers. So I think the idea of the place might be the secret history of real estate development. Um, and it's interesting to conceive of it in that particular way. Now, <clears throat> we're talking about, you know, what, what does one learn? To that point, um, Augustine Rome had probably the largest population in Europe, had a million people. And to emphasize what he did as a developer, and this to me is a wonderful little detail, um, he had, of course, as every emperor did, coins minted. But instead of his image on them, he had his front door stamped on the coin. We talk about that in the book. To signify the significance of place, and yes, place that he was responsible for and that he constructed. But if you think about this theoretically, from his place, the city develops and grows outward. And coins are very political and uh, very significant in terms of civilization, social development, etc. Vancouver, I think, prides itself on being good placemakers. We have a good reputation anyway. Is it deserved? <laughs>
This is Shrink. <laughs> Vancouver is, uh, I think, the one kind of place that Vancouver is, is famous for, at least I agree with, is returning the public realm to the, at the waterfront. But I don't really know that there's a great place, central place. There are many opportunities in Vancouver to create a great place, but I don't know that there is one great place. They have tried at Canada Place, they've tried at the library, they've tried. I mean, you need that place where you hang a mayor in effigy, you know, you have to have that one place. And I don't know that we have that in Vancouver, but Vancouver's a very special city. There are so many other things that divert people from the city, the mountains, the water. But I think uh, the place in Vancouver is not a casino, it's not a place. I mean, having just uh, commented on, you know, the Piazza Square, I think that in the 21st century, we don't need a single place, and a single place really doesn't exist. We have a number of places that function um, in that particular role, and it's almost a, a principle of modernism, because with modernism, we break down the unified essentialist structure whether it's an institution like um, you know, the church, um, we break those things down into pieces. And modernist art, modernist literature is made up of pieces, fragments. T.S. Eliot you know, talks about, I measure in J.L. for Prufock, I measure my life by you know, uh, teaspoons. Uh, you know, it's the small steps that count, but you have to be aware of the small steps. So I don't think we have the need for a single place, we have a lot of places that may function similarly, but that they don't uh, define themselves by their singularity. They just do this. And, and yet the developers that you write about that we remember are the ones who take the big steps. Uh, how, you have a passion for Hostman, I think. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, in fact, if you would say he was the greatest developer, or would you have another choice? Who was? Houseman. Houseman. Well, Houseman should explain. Uh, Houseman fell into it. <laughs> Houseman uh, was a uh, kind of a planner, or really, he started more as a politician, yeah. bureaucrat. bureaucrat, yeah. and uh, he was uh, he like was engaged by things. Napoleon the Third uh, to plan Paris. And Napoleon the Third had been to London. And he saw how modern London was being. And Paris was full of miserable streets and uh, sewer, uh, exposed sewer lines and people were sick and there was no air to play in. So he had this vision of creating Paris as grand city. And so he had the power to do it and he, uh, he engaged Houseman as his kind of project manager, if you know, climate. And of course that was one of the first times uh, in the development of cities that uh, expropriation was used or the exercise of eminent domain where they expropriated many, many, many houses in order to pierce through neighborhoods and put in these great boulevards in order to produce you know, Paris. It was all like, also one of the, play, the first places where they uh, invoked the private-public partnership. And we think that's a great modern invention that was done by Napoleon III, where the state would identify projects and guarantee the loans from the banks. Of course, the whole banking system was changing. In the 1800s, the money was much more available. It wasn't only in the hands of the aristocracy. And uh, so the, the, the government would guarantee the loan, and then developers and architects would build buildings with those guarantees with the hope that the government would never have to pay them off. And in most cases, they were successful. So Hausman, uh, of course, had, uh, but it took 10 years to build Paris. And by the end of those 10 years, people in Paris were fed up. Napoleon III was getting bad press. And he finally had to fire in order to save his political career. He fired Hausmann. Hausmann then went off uh, with his tail between his legs to Corsica. And he was redeemed. He was on a very small uh, pension or uh, salary. And then he was made the representative of Corsica and the National Assembly. New statue. But Paris would not be Paris it is today without Napoleon III as the developer, houseman, his planner, and the bankers who you know, 
hospital. Um, it just occurred to me, maybe this isn't strange, but uh, these great developer stories all, always seem to have a rise and fall. Is there something Shakespearean or Greek about great developers? Certainly, I don't know. Reaching for the sky. I mean, uh, one thing I tell my students, there's really no school of real estate development. It's all the school of hard knocks. And the real estate developers that we read about in this book have come from all different walks of life. I mean, I've seen real estate developers who are military people, who are actors, who are doctors, who are, and uh, they become real estate developers. The universities that try to teach real estate development today are really teaching asset management, and they can't quite teach the, the creative element in real estate development. Because all these real estate developers had a creative element in We've managed to get through almost uh, 40 minutes without ever mentioning a certain real estate developer who will be in the news for the rest of our lives. I no. Absolutely. Would you put Trump in that category? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do put Trump in it. Of course, he had a better education because his father was a real estate developer. <laughs> and his father left him a lot of money that he could use as equity. Because the one thing that real estate developers try to do is use other people's money. In this case, he was using his father's money. So he's a real estate developer. He's not a very good one, or he's given real estate development. <laughs> Bad name in certain cases. But uh, he certainly has always had an image, and he certainly believes that he's doing good, even when he's not doing good. I'm sure he, he believes that. Altruism. Altruism. Uh, no, he's he... in the book because I started writing the book five years ago before Mr. Trump uh, thought about running for president. Uh, we uh, decided to leave him in. Maybe he'll sue it. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had a personal relationship with one of the great developers. Second row. In second row, yeah. Tell us a little. This is a Canadian connection to here. Well, when I worked for, I worked for a very fine architectural firm called I M Pay and Associates. I M Pay came out of Harvard. And before he opened his own office, he was a division of Web and Net, the real estate company. So this was a real estate company run by William Zekinov, who ironically enough, made his money by investing the money of the Astor fortune in real estate, another thing. And, um, and then I am pay, uh, when I went off to Europe uh, for a couple of years with the US Army, I am pay broke away from Web and Net and opened their own office. And when I came back, IMP was designing for William Zeckendorf. They did most of his work, if not all of them. Uh, they were designing uh, Place Ville Marie in Montreal. I had just come back from France. Uh, they thought I spoke French. It would be a good idea for me to go to Montreal. And of course, so my family moved to Montreal. We liked it because it was a kind of a halfway house between Europe and North America. And so it was a great experience being the resident architect on that building and being inside the workings because we worked very closely with Second Off in the development office. Why don't you tell the story about the La Tour d'Argent, the restaurant? Vaccine. Vaccine, sorry. You want me to tell Yeah, this? it's a wonderful story about Place Ville Marie, Second Off, and what happened to uh, the My wife and I got married in Paris and uh, for our wedding lunch, uh, we went, four of us, uh, the maid of honor, Right. The maid of honor, the, uh, the best man, Mary and myself, went to Maxime's for a wedding lunch where I met the, the son of the owner, Mr. Van der Boel. He was the, uh, kind of greeted us. I met him again two years later on the roof of Place Ville-Marie. I returned from France and uh, went to work for IM Pay, went up to Van Montreal as the resident architect. The building had been topped off, and there was another building being built two blocks away that was threatening to be higher than Place Wilbury. Talk about the quest for the sky. So Zekendorf ordered that there be two more floors added to Place Wilbury. He had no idea what he was going to do with them, but he did have an idea. Finally, he said he was going to turn those two floors into the greatest restaurant in the world. It was going to be Maxime's de Moyab. And so he flew son of the owner of Maxime's to Montreal where I met him again. The three of us were standing on the roof of Place Ville Marie and he was looking at the view and expounding what a great location this would be for a restaurant, Maxime's de Molia. 
And uh, the owner, Maxime, said, but where is the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this building, this building was, there was no room for the kitchen. And so he said, well, the kitchen is in the basement, and there's a high-speed elevator that's going to service the restaurant. My friend from Maxine said, no, no, no. If the first table is more than 75 feet from the kitchen, you cannot have the rote cuisine, and you cannot have the hot cuisine. <laughs> and that was the end of Maxine's de Montreal. <laughs> <coughs> and the book is full of it. So, uh, perhaps any of you have a question or comment? subjects have been such uh, creative, charismatic, sexy man <coughs> as Leonard Cohen, <coughs> the stalker, David Mamma, Husband Arba. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> in working with her is because he's the opposite of some of these figures that in fact I have had the honor of knowing and uh, working with. I sit on her. <laughs> now, now her, I can't get, let you get away with uh, some little comment on Trump, you know. Um, it's a single event for your profession. There's never been a real estate developer president. There's been an architect amateur architect in Jefferson. And in Canada, we had an architecture buff, new age guy called Mackenzie King. But uh, right now, Donald Trump is defining your profession to the world. And it's associated with things like blitz and tax avoidance <laughs> and hanging out with celebrities. What does one do as a real estate developer in the face of that? Well, I think you continue to be a good real estate developer. I mean, like in any profession, there are good people and bad people. And uh, unfortunately, because real estate is not a profession, real estate development is not a profession. It's not controlled by any kind of ethical organization like lawyers or doctors or, you know. Um, it's a difficult thing to control because anybody, before, before the Trumps or before the Industrial Revolution, the only people who really built were people with money, and people with money were educated in school and had some sense of uh, aesthetic and culture. And once the Industrial Revolution came along, and you know, mass education, anybody could be a real estate developer. All you needed was a wheelbarrow and a brother-in-law, and you were in the building business. And so, uh, and our cities are the result of that kind of democratic view of the profession, because it's not regulated in any way. So it's rare when you get a second off who hooks up, and it's always the best real estate developments are very uh, cultured and aesthetic developers, uh, hooking up with very good architects and having a very fine money source, and being in an environment where they're allowed to perform what they want to do. Somebody asked me, I think, at one of these sessions, who are the developers I really admire, and of course, second off is one. Here, I think Ian Gillespie has those, has those characteristics in terms of a developer who wants to really make a mark, to, because buildings last for a long time. Doctors stand can bury their mistakes, but developers and architects can. They live on forever. So it's, uh, uh, so we have I have nothing really to say about it. I mean, I don't think that Trump is a great developer, and I, I don't think he'll make a better president. Uh, thanks for your talk and sharing your stories. Uh, on a similar vein to uh, your response on uh, on how, uh, I think I was catching it, the barriers to entry of real estate have been in the past not as high as they are current day in terms of in a capitalist market we see ever increasing escalations of land value etc cetera, etc cetera, the power of connections and in an urban, in an urban planning context the complex
complexity of zoning, um, view corridors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, my question for you is: given how little the real estate development world has changed from Roman times to the present era, but given this hyper capitalist and very restrictive system that maybe might change, uh, how do you see real estate um, evolving given these fair Well, I, I told you, uh, I said before that the process isn't very different, but certainly the players are different. And I guess the best way to answer your question is to perhaps do a comparison between the United States and Canada, which are two very different environments. Um, in Canada, we have very few banks. And money is highly controlled in, in one area. And equity is very difficult to, to develop. And that's why in Canada, we have created many large professional real estate companies, Polygon, uh, West Bank, uh, all of these, that real estate development for very large and major things apart from what small builders could do on their own, is really in the hands of a very small group in the United States, that's not true. In the United States, uh, it's very easy to get capital, easier than it is here. And real estate development is, was, has been traditionally, traditionally been in you know, very broad, a very broad market and much easier to access than it is here. So um, in that sense, it's different and it's changed. In the case of, uh, of a place like France in the 1800s, Real estate developers had to be very plugged in to the emperor, you know, and uh, had to be very plugged in. And of course, even today, the highly skilled real estate developer is very plugged into City Hall, knows their way around City Hall, understands you know, how the politics works, and that's how they get things done. So entering real estate in Canada is very difficult, and it's usually done by going through one of the major companies. I tell my students who want to real estate development unless you're prepared to take the risk yourself of starting small and, and building a company that is to work for a major real estate developer and learn the business. And uh, so I don't know whether that answers your question totally, but the, the process hasn't changed, but the players and the way they interact certainly changes. Yes? Which one of you is going to outlive the other? Ask my dog. <laughs> Why do you ask? Well, 125 is supposed to be the top. Uh, the humans can live too. Okay. So far. Okay. But we both have a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> At least another book in there. Well, yeah. just simply uh, on the basis of of the facts. I mean, Ira is much younger than I am, so. No I guarantee. He, I think he'll love me. That's true. You're, you're, you're back there. Chronologically. Huh? Chronologically. Yeah, but he leaves a much more exciting life. Okay, so it's quality, not. Another reason why he'll love me. Yes. Hi, uh, I had a question about, um, you said you wrote a book about the, uh, the new Bay Bridge and the San yep. Francisco area. Yeah, it's the, yes. There's some uh, uh, controversy about uh, there's some faulty uh, construction. There's water leaking into the combination of bowls or something. I was wondering if you could give an update on uh, what, what's the latest with that. I don't know the latest, but what you say is correct. There was a tiny section that it, you know exposed that kind of fault. I understand it has been corrected. There was a quick repair, but now there's a much more permanent repair to it. And the best thing to do would be go on to the Bay Bridge website because it's very open. They have videos of everything. They have videos of the repair taking place. They have complete documentation. Uh, it's a public bridge, so they have a public responsibility uh, to it. The bridge has an amazing history to it, and you might want to pick up the book. These are small little books illustrated by my co-author, uh, the architect Donald McDonald. Um, he illustrates them, and I write them. Um, they're only about 100 pages, maybe, but they're hardback, very handsome, 
and we are just finishing a book on the first new bridge in Portland, Oregon in almost 50 years. It's called Tillicum Crossing, mm -hmm. a very elegant, beautiful bridge, quite distinct because it permits no cars or trucks. It is only pedestrians, cyclists, and light rapid rail, and apparently it's the first bridge of that sort in the United States in, again, about 25 or 30 years. Um, there are a lot of fascinating design features about Tillicum Crossing. So we're just finishing that up, and it'll probably be out next year. And again, he illustrates I write. Cool. Very pro. Uh, you got a few uh, statements in the book. Sound to me to be contentious. You say, possessing land by force never leads to certainty. Really? Well, uh, you need land in order to build. And the one thing that uh, developers are seeking is certainty. They want to know that they can build on that land, and that's why we have laws and building codes. And, and if you don't have those laws, or you don't have certainty, it's very hard to develop. Uh, in fact, in the Great Dissolution, when uh, Henry VIII took all the land away from the Catholic Church and distributed it amongst his friends, they didn't want to build on it because they didn't feel they had title, they had clear title, that the church would come back and get the land again, and so they wanted certainty. Uh, land that is uh, not uh, divided or sold by laws or captured in law of war can always be returned to somebody else. It's when you're and that was exemplified when, you know, in Venezuela, when Ortega left Venezuela and everybody thought, Venezuela was up for development. The developers ran in apartment buildings, hotels. Then Ortega came back 10 years later and he expropriated everything without, without any compensation. He just took it all back and said, this doesn't belong to you. It belongs to us. And, uh, so there was no certainty. Well, uh, we always begin these sessions, certainly at SFU, with an acknowledgment of the unceded territories, uh, whatever First Nations is in the world. Well, no, it's not uncertain because I think the First Nations have been very clear that they're not going to uh, to make a uh, an issue of a land that's held by the private sector, and they're only going after land that's held by the government. So that hasn't really been been a problem. And of course, uh, we've had 200 years where we haven't settled the treaties. That's the problem. I mean, King George promised uh, the native people title to their lands, and uh, we've been negotiating treaties for 200 years and not resolved them. So now there are two or three treaties that have been resolved. Only those structures built by men.